Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Nadine Stille. I'm founder of Coach Me Vancouver and your host for today. Coach Me Vancouver is a local coaching community to help you take your life and career to the next level. In the current health crisis, we wanted to do our part to support um, our community in a meaningful and uh, a valuable way with the expertise and all the skills of our Coach Me featured coaches. And this is how we got together um, for this virtual chat series from our homes to yours. As you can see, uh, Iris is uh, at home, I'm at home too. And um, while we help you thrive through our online series, we will also collect donations that will go directly to the Greater Vancouver Food Bank, um, who is experiencing a huge demand um, right now and they currently need our support so thank you so much for everyone who made a donation um when they signed up to the uh, to the session tonight uh, one of our amazing coaches iris uh, will speak uh, and uh, walk you through or us through uh, ways of increasing our resilience through positive psychology get ready this is an amazing session um before i start and hand over to iris uh, let me just uh, tell you that obviously this session will be recorded we have plans to publish it later on um, there will be breaks and opportunities for us uh, for you to ask questions in between and we encourage you to switch your cameras on so we can see you as well and without further ado welcome iris thank you nadine and um, thank you everyone for coming here uh taking out about an hour of your evening, a valuable time that you can spend doing other things, obviously, to share with me and Nadine on uh, this very, very meaningful subject, uh, and which is even more important at this difficult time that we're going through. And I would like to thank you, Nadine, for really taking out the time to organize this uh, event um, for free and to create um, more funding, uh, more support for the Food Bank. So today we are looking at resilience through the lens of positive psychology. Um, I don't think this is a term that is very familiar to many people, so I thought it's important for me to explain what exactly is positive psychology. So when the, traditionally, when we think about psychology, we often uh, think of uh, mental illness or um, deficit-based uh, kind of psychology. Uh, generally, this type of psychology focused on asking the question of uh, what's your area for improvement? Um, what problems do we want to solve today? So it's very, very um, focused on negativity. And in fact, that is a kind of um, uh, evolution evolutionary benefit that as human beings uh, we have developed. We just tend to gravitate towards the negative because it protects us uh, from uh, danger uh, in, in the wildlife and it just still stayed with us uh, even though uh, the saber-toothed tigers are not around for thousands of years already. Uh, but in the uh, late 1990s, uh, one of the psychologists um, in the positive psychology field uh, started to really popularize, popularize this field of positive psychology and remind us that, hey, there's actually another few goals in psychology that we haven't been thinking about as much. Um, and that is about well-being. It's about how we can um, really develop the resources to have a flourishing life, to thrive. Uh, what about optimal performance? So all these uh, questions start becoming more and more popular. Uh, so we start asking, oh, what has gone well? What are your strengths? What are your dreams? And what are the things that people have done well that makes it work? And how can we learn from them? So hopefully this gives you a sense of what positive psychology is. Techniques in positive psychology actually can be used uh, for both the clinical uh, population uh, and non-clinical population as well. So for example, if you know any loved ones or even yourself have suffered from any kind of a mental illness, such as depression and anxiety, they can also take advantage of the tool that we will be sharing here today. And actually some of the tools come from therapy um, that have been proven to be very effective uh, for depression and anxiety as well. So I just wanna give you that context. 
Um, also, I thought it's interesting uh, to note that I actually don't come from a very traditional positive psychology background. And after spending lots of time in private sector, public sector, in business such as marketing and human resources, and now finally doing my Master of Applied Positive Psychology, I realized that a lot of the tools um, that we learn today um, can be taught uh, in the business, in school, to make our workforce, our students, our teenagers, young people, much more resilient. Um, so really, it's my dream to evangelize a lot of the tools that are studied in positive psychology, because I think that every one of us can use a little bit of those tools to have a happier, more fulfilled life and to deal with the challenges in our day-to-day -day life more effectively. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, we will actually start by talking about the topic of post-traumatic growth, uh, or PTG. People who manage to thrive after a trauma, for example, a layoff, a divorce, a natural disaster, are actually very, very resilient. So scientists study what did they do right so that we can uh, teach uh, those of us, for example, soldiers going into combat uh, to help them develop that resiliency and uh, prevent them from developing post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. We will also um, look at an overview of all the research, um, the, the protective factors that contribute to resilience and have a focus on the specific factor of optimism. And at the end, hopefully we'll have about 10, 15 minutes or so to have a discussion to answer some questions. Now, we have been spending a lot of time isolating, not having a lot of really face-to-face -face, um, interaction. And uh, also this is a webinar, so I don't have a lot of that uh, usual privilege of sensing your emotions uh, or seeing your face, getting a sense so how you're feeling. So I thought let's do something uh, interesting today to do a bit of a check-in. So I have set up a poll. Uh, it's on pollav.com. Okay. Okay. Some people are already jumping in. Uh, so you can type in maybe one to three emotions. Uh, if you change your mind, you can clear your responses and enter a couple more. So let's just give you a few more, maybe seconds. 10 seconds more, and we will be able to see a word cloud. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, Nadine, I feel that there's lots of uh, positivity in this call. Don't say it like it's something bad. So can you guys see the screen? Yeah. This is what you have all put in. So lots of positivity, curiosity, calmness, uh, being grounded. Some of you are feeling a bit anxious. So just let you soak it in. And this is an online community that thanks to Nadine that we just spilled for tonight. So what I would like you to do next is, uh, and I, I would be flipping to that next screen for you to answer the next question, is to get you to close your eyes for a little bit and hold everyone's um, feelings in your heart and think about what you would like the other people on this call to feel. So now thinking about the emotions, your feelings, what do you hope for them? Right, thank you everyone. So I just shared the browser too. You should be able to see what everyone has put on here. Can you see as well, Nadine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. It's inspiring. <laughs> so uh, feel free to put in more, but I just would like to call out that um, one of the most important factors that contribute to resilience is connection. And uh, I know a lot of our connections are virtual now. And I just would like to invite you to 
find creative ways to stay connected with your loved ones and even with strangers like what we're doing today to share that love, that peace, um, that hope with them because we all need each other, including myself, to stay um, positive, loving and uh, grounded in this difficult time. Now, let's uh, officially switch to the topic of post-traumatic growth. As you can see on this photo, post-traumatic growth, um, as some psychologists call it, it's like a gift that is wrapped in barbed wire. You will get to the other side of that bridge, that suffering, but you do need to go through it and accept it. In adversity, sometimes we may feel that it's like a door that is slammed into our face. So I hope that some of the strategies that I'll be sharing next can act like a door that can lead you to some other opportunities as well. If many people have been studied to achieve growth, manage to do so. So scientists have found that there are three main cognitive processes that are involved in post-traumatic growth. The first one is construing benefits. Um, those of you uh, who probably have been doing this, right? Uh, say, if I'm someone who are not, not liking my job, then at this point, I might feel that, well, at least I have a job. So I feel really fortunate. For some of you, you might have uh, lost a job. Then uh, say, if you have the fortune of being in Canada or have a social security net, then you may feel that, well, at least I'm in a good um uh, positive society that is supporting my transition in this difficult time. Um, but of course, um, construing benefits should be done with care. Um, I would say that do it with yourself. Um, people all have the time that they need to recover from feeling um, difficulty. So we don't want to jump in too soon and tell them that, well, at least you have this, at least you have that when they're not ready to do so. Another concept that hasn't been talked about a lot is the downward social comparison. Um, so I think a lot of you who come here are probably really into personal development, are all ambitious people who want to just get better at what you're doing. Uh, and we, that, the, the problem with that is that you tend to do upward social comparison, admiring your role models, thinking, wow, somebody is so inspiring. I want to be like them as well. But sometimes the downside of that is that it makes us feel a little bit um, less capable or maybe less able, uh, less fortunate. So those people who are really resilient, they're really good at um, choosing what to think, choosing who they can compare themselves to. So this is another tip uh, under that big umbrella of construing benefits. But what if your circumstances are just so dire that it's just so hard to find benefits in your situation? Another finding is that those people who manage to do well or survive in post-traumatic, uh, in, in a traumatic situation is meaning. Um, and perhaps the Holocaust is the type of situation where there's really no benefit that can be going on in that situation. And uh, Dr. Viktor Frankl, which is uh, a very famous psychologist or psychiatrist at the time um, who survived the Holocaust uh, from a concentration camp, would probably be one of the best person to speak about how to find meaning, how people have survived uh, such a tragedy, managed to find meaning and survive and thrive. So Dr. Frankel's uh, advice um, and the finding from his time at the concentration camp is that those who manage to get through tend to be people who has a why to live with. They look forward to something. They, they have people that they really want to make a difference for in their lives. Maybe for him, it's going back to his university to share all that he has learned from the concentration uh, camp about how people survive and thrive. Um, so that's why one of the concepts he shared is the self-transcendence of human existence. I think some of you are probably familiar with Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. 
So at the top of that triangle is the self-actualization. Um, so self-transcendence compared to that is actually even above self-actualization. So what that really means is that the, the highest uh, kind of fulfillment is beyond yourself. It transcends yourself. It's about looking outwards to think about what is in the world. What are some other people that you can serve? And thinking that your life actually has a mission. And you want to be resilient. You want to work hard in this um, period of difficulty um, to serve those other people, to serve your cause, because you do have a mission. So he famously say that the true meaning of life is to be discovered in the world rather than within, um, rather than within man or his own psyche, as though it were a closed system. So it means that you have to look outwards. Spirituality is also one way to find meaning for some people. So if you are religious, uh, definitely this could be a time for you to get closer to your religious institution or if you are in non-organized uh, religion, just getting close to that tradition is, um, can be really helpful for you. For those of you who are not religious but you are spiritual, that generally means that you do have the ability to feel connected with a larger whole. Some people call it the universe. Some people, it's just a, a larger community. And you feel that there's something um, meaningful in this situation. There's a grander plan. And uh, that is generally um, uh, another pathway that helps some people get through. But what if you are someone who's not religious, not spiritual? This thing is just a little bit too wishy-washy or too mystical to you then I would also share another angle, which is um, the concept of sacred moments. So the psychologist who discovered this kind of uh, phenomenon uh, found that even for those who are not spiritual or religious, they get to enjoy moments where they feel that it's, it's sacred, it um, uh, transcends those day-to-day uh, -day ordinary things. Uh, or a feeling of interconnectedness with other people, or um, feeling emotions that are somewhat spiritual. For example, the emotion of awe, uh, like nature, or being humbled by someone, or feeling a sense of peace. Um, there are some more as well, uh, some other uh, phenomena that contribute to the concept of sacred moments, but I will only focus on these with some examples. For example, uh, you've gone through a storm and uh, in the woods, you notice that there's a little piece of flower that managed to weather the storm. Um, and you just feel so in awe by um, this uh, feeling that something so fragile uh, managed to survive this kind of um, trauma. And you feel a sense of peace. You pick up the flower and savor it. You smell it and you feel content. This is, this is an example of a sacred moment. Interconnectedness. It could be just feeling connected with someone that maybe is so different for you, but that shared humanity moved you. For example, a sense of joy between these two people in the photo over here. Um, nature is a great way to elicit spiritual emotions of awe as well. So I encourage you to really think about what are some little ordinary things in your day-to-day -day life um, that could be sacred moments for you? Discovering these moments can give you those uh, little bursts of positivity, those positive emotions that can last you um, to, 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 to help you weather and, and offset the uh, negative emotions as well. This is an example of a sacred moment for me, the moment when I found a song on YouTube. I um, actually heard about it from the radio. It's a UBC music student who decided to start a project quarantine. And um, he recruited 150 or more than that singers from all over the world to sing the song When You Believe. And they managed to do this in a virtual choir format. 
and it just really blew my mind. I remember that day I was uh, kind of feeling a little bit low, just kind of bored and down. And after I found the song, it really just uplifted me. And that is my sacred moment. This is the end screen of that song, a quote by Mother Teresa. Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. So I just want to pause here with you and ask you a question. What are some small things you can do with great love today for yourself and for other people? We can come back to this topic with a discussion later. All right. So moving on back to the cognitive processes just, we just talked about, and we've gone through the first two. And the last one is optimism, which is going to be the focus of the second half of our conversation today. Um, so here's a great segue for us to also give you an um, overview of resilience, because optimism is part of the resilience protective factors that I was about to share. So resilience is the capacity to adapt successfully to adversity. Resilience can definitely be learned. It's not a fixed trait. And resilience can be the way you do things as well. This photo here shows you eight different kinds of strategies that psychologists who studied resilience found um, that can help you become more resilient. Um, so a lot of them over here on the left-hand side has to do with self-awareness, self-regulation. For example, being in touch with your own emotions and knowing what to do with it, right? Uh, having the mental agility to change the way you think, to come up with uh, new ideas, um, to be resourceful to solve a problem can all contribute to resiliency. On this right-hand side, connections, uh, we kind of just talked about that earlier. Um, going out to contribute to other people's lives or letting other people contribute to your life, asking for help is a great way to build resiliency. Self-efficacy means knowing, believing that you have the ability to effect change in your life. And these, um, this all comes hand in hand with all the other factors that we're talking about. When you have self-awareness, you know your strengths, you know when you need help from other people, you know how to regulate yourself, you tend to feel more self-efficacy. Physiology, um, all of us are genetically predisposed to feel either more positive or negative. However, the good news is that we can do a lot of things to change that, to offset what our genes have done to us. So for example, uh, meditation, uh, sleep, nutrition, exercising are all things that you can do to change our brain chemistry, uh, our body to, for example, injecting dopamine into our brain um, after exercising uh, to give us uh, a boost in our mood. Positive institutions, uh, Nadine's Coach Me is an example of positive institution, setting up a platform for us to have a conversation today to discuss uh, how to become more resilient. The U.S. Army is actually an example of a positive institution who is trying to help their soldiers build resilience. Um, so all these um, strategies what we discussed earlier actually have been redeveloped into a resilience training program for the U.S. Army. Um, like I said earlier, when we prepare people, when we build their resources, um, they whenever really the storm comes, Comes when there's adversity, like going into combat, uh, you are more um, resilient towards those um, um, those challenges. And I would like to highlight here ATC. This is a tool that we just talked about earlier. It's something that we will be focusing on later on. All right. So this resilience program that is developed 
by Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, uh, has been used in a lot of other settings as well. And that's why I would like to share more of that to you. For example, healthcare, corporate environment, government, um, schools, uh, universities. And it has been studied by a lot of um, researchers over the 25 years. So this program has been the widely researched uh, depression prevention program. So like I said earlier, the more skills you learn, uh, the more likely you can prevent um, depressive symptoms um, and feel more powerful in the face of adversity. Now let's dive in into the topic of optimism. So when you think of the word optimism, um, some people may be kind of resistant to it. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge that. Feeling, uh, p- those of you who may feel resistant to the word optimism might be because of certain assumptions you make. So to clear optimism's name, I would like to say that optimism is not sunshines, it's not unicorns or rainbows. It's not about assuming, uh, blankly assuming positive thinking and not paying attention to the suffering that people are going through or you are going through. It's not about ignoring those things and not doing anything about that. True optimism, and especially optimism that can be learned as a skill, um, includes the following. For example, the ability to notice and expect the positive in our lives and not let our negativity bias take control of our entire consciousness. Secondly, um, optimism includes focusing on the things that we can control. And also, it's not just about thinking about good things and not doing anything, sitting on your hands. It's about coming up with a plan and taking purposeful actions as well. So optimism is very, very action-focused, and it's very deliberate about what to do with the thoughts that you are in your mind. So to understand optimism, I would like to introduce the concept of the explanatory style. So the explanatory style is a type of thinking style, like the way we think. Um, Its textbook definition is um, how people explain to themselves about why they experience a particular event, whether it's a positive or a negative event. Um, So psychologists who study explanatory style realize that there are two types. One type is more optimistic and another is more pessimistic. And there are three dimensions that are involved in um, understanding someone's explanatory style. And that is permanence, pervasiveness, and personalization. Let's unpack that a little bit more. So whenever there's that event that's happening, for example, the crisis that we're experiencing right now, the pessimist would tend to think that, whoa, this thing is going to last forever. I don't know. Um, are you sure you're still going to do that? This event is going to last um, a long time, and I just don't want to do anything. Throwing in the tile, towel. Um, pessimists also tend to assume that something that goes wrong in one domain of their life will also transcend into the other area of their life. So that pervasiveness is big for them. They feel that it would undermine everything. Pessimists also tend to take things personally. Um, So let's say I work with university students as well. And um, sometimes when uh, they are looking for a job and didn't get the job after an interview, um, the pessimistic student tend to think that, oh, it's just uh, me not being smart enough and just uh, never ready for a job like that. Um, But what would an optimistic person think then? Again, in the same interview situation, the optimist will think that, you know what, this is just a temporary thing. I'm going to work harder on this. I'm going to practice. And it's, it's, uh, it will pass. Uh, also, the optimistic people will think that, well, it's only uh, this job, for example, that doesn't work out for me. Uh, I'm going to keep trying. And maybe some other companies will work well for me, as will, will hire me or appreciate my talent. Uh, 
I also have students who don't do quite well in a particular subject at school. And because of that, that negativity, that self-doubt, basically just um, get into all the other areas of their life. For example, they worry that they will never get a job because they don't do well with a course on analytics. So uh, it's very, very important for ourselves or people like you, like Echo over here, you were talking about stu uh, supporting students, right? Think about, okay, wait a second. Um, this is just temporary. This is uh, just about one little domain of your life. And you can con have control over this and don't make a blanket statement about everything. Uh, the last thing, not taking things personally, sometimes... It could be circumstances that affect the outcome uh, of an event. It's not always yourself. Now, what about good events then? Generally, the how things work would reverse. So, for example, whenever there's a good event, the optimist would think that, wow, I have done well in this, um, for example, this, um, this project. And I trust that this kind of uh, if this the success is a reflection of my 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 um, efforts of my abilities, and I believe I will do well in the future too. And that is an example of high self efficacy because you're believing your own ability to affect change to to succeed. Um, those who are optimistic would also believe that you know what I do well at school. I. I'm sure that it's a reflection of my conscientiousness, maybe my critical thinking skills, and I will do well at work as well. They have that belief in themselves. Um, they also are more likely, like I said earlier, to uh, self-congratulate, to pat themselves on the back and know that their efforts play a role in that good event happening. So all of these contribute to that self-efficacy and ultimately resilience. So I'd like to pause a little bit here for you to think about how you generally explain events to your life. Do you tend to be more of an optimistic thinker or pessimistic thinker? And we'll have a little exercise for you too. All right. So what do you do with explanatory style then? Now that you know your style, uh, I just said that you can do something with it. So the ATC tool, which I alerted, alluded to earlier on the former slide, is a very, very powerful and evidence-based tool that has been used in cognitive behavioral therapy uh, that has been a, um, a very successful tool used to cure or treat depression and help people reduce their depressive symptom. And people who are in the non-clinical environment can also benefit from it. So the ATC stands for activating event, um, thought, and consequence. And like I said earlier, you can do something with it. So we want to talk about how we can dispute it too. So what's an activating event then? Um, it can be big or it can be small, right? A relatively bigger one could be one that I have gone through myself, which is a layoff being laid off after seven years with a company can be a really, really hurtful thing for someone to go through, right? And uh, an activating event is a thought. How you interpret it, the thoughts that come up in your head is um, uh, the second stage that we're going to go into. So for someone who is more pessimistic they, and, and have that more permanent kind of explanatory style, they would tend to think that I won't be able to find a good job like this anymore. Um, and the consequence of that is uh, I'm depressed and anxious all the time. Um, so if it was uh, me supporting someone like that, I tend to be the, more of the optimist uh, with the situation actually, is to uh, come up with the evidence so, for example, uh, you could use um, those prompts, like uh, these sentences. For example, you can say, well, this is not true. It's not true that I won't be able to find a good job like this because I have been with the company for seven years. I have been recognized. I have a lot of achievements behind my back, and I can take these achievements, this kind of skills to contribute to a uh, future role. Okay. Um, 
Alternative is another way of looking at things. So ten, pessimistic people tend to have that tunnel vision. So they think that this is the only option I have. I used to work for telecom, right? So uh, telecom is my only way out. Like, I don't know. I don't like it, but what else can I do with my life? I have been in this job for seven years. I don't know what else I can do. So when we have get out, gotten out of that rut, or if you are helping someone who is in that rut, uh, one way to ask them is that: um, What are some other ways, though, uh, towards a fulfilling career? Maybe a more accurate way of seeing the situation is that you have a lot of talent. You have some other uh, career paths that you can um, examine, and this is uh, not really uh, the only way for you to make a living. Another strategy is called uh, putting things in perspective. So people who tend to be a bit pessimistic tend to have that catastrophic way of thinking, uh, always assuming the worst, worst, worst scenario, um, but never think about the the more likely kind of scenario. Uh, so one way for us to support ourselves, if you are the person who tend to catastrophize. Uh, is to think about okay, what is something that is in the middle? It's kind of likely. If you're having trouble, get someone to help you, and then come up with a plan to work towards that most likely situation. Uh, like I said earlier, being an optimist takes action, takes a plan, and um, this particular situ situation, this kind of technique, requires you to really sit down, stop thinking, and start planning for that most likely option. Now, let's do a quick exercise. Um, you can just sit here and think about an activating event that has upset you. It could be something really big about losing a job, but it could be something really small about maybe somebody made a comment and you're just wondering, okay, what, what's that? And then um, ask yourself, what are some underlying thoughts that may have upset you? Is it of a permanence nature, pervasive nature? Um, did you take it personally? And how did you feel as a result of that? And are there some ways that you can dispute that particular thinking style? Um, a little bit of caveat over here is that you don't want to dispute facts. You want to dispute a thought, an interpretation of a fact. So if someone, for example, has uh, lost a loved one, uh, you don't want to dispute that particular fact and try to yank them out of their sadness. However, later when they're healing and they're having a lot of, uh, for example, catastrophic thinking, a lot of um, uh, tunnel vision, that is the time you can do to, to help them dispute the way they think. And like I said earlier, you want to wait until you're ready if you are ever using this kind of tool. Now, moving on, uh, we are coming to the very last component of our uh, session today. Uh, that is thinking traps. As you can see, there's uh, your head being inside a bird cage. So thinking trap is basically a, a broader concept that, uh, of what we just talked about. Uh, it, they are thinking styles that tend to limit us, that tend to trap us. And there are many of them. So I thought near the end of this call, I'll go through a couple of them. This is a big list, so we cannot go through every single thing. Um, so I'll highlight this uh, just to limit your attention. Jumping to the conclusions is basically the grandmother of all the thinking traps. Uh, it means believing that one is certain about a situation uh, despite little or no supporting evidence. I can give you an example. Uh, recently, I'm working on a group project with some classmates, and some of them make a comment, lots of comments on the parts that I wrote. And I tend to feel a little bit offended, and I felt that, oh, why am I offended? And once I unpack those thinking, I realized that I was uh, feeling that having so many comments on my part means that I'm not a good writer. So um, that feeling of uh, offendedness, right, or, or anger uh, is a result of that interpretation. So the strategy that I would give to myself is to slow down to say, hey, hey, what is the evidence here? Um, uh, 
it, it, I got a lot of uh, feedback on my part, probably because people uh, don't understand that subject very well. It's not always due to my writing, or maybe it's a very complex subject, and we could have discussed more during our group calls to have some more clarity before I continue to write. So it's not a judgment on the way I write. Um, so uh, what's following is just a ton of other uh, thinking traps that I could leave that to you to go through. You can feel free to take a screenshot if you want or look at the recordings. Um, so we're not going through a lot of the detail, but I just want to highlight that some of the um, uh, exploratory style, the pessimistic style are actually captured over here. They're personalizing right? Uh, some kind of overgeneralizing, right? Being pervasive, the tunnel vision, catastrophic thinking are all in here. And on this right-hand side column, uh, there are some tips that I have shared on how you can challenge your thinking and get out of that negative thinking trap. All right. Um, I was just, uh, one more thing that I found um, when we prepared for this, uh, for this call, you actually, um, so there's a really good way on using that um, that mm -hmm. list in a different way, right? Um, it's by identifying your, like going backwards. If you can just yeah. quickly explain how that works and then people Exactly. Can Thank you for highlighting later on. So, so of course, a lot of times uh, we, we are so, um, our feeling just comes so fast, right? So uh, one tip is to go into uh, this chart uh, in this particular column. And of course, it's not um, exhaustive. Uh, one tip that I have for you is to go to the book. I have references, a book on the, the seven resilience protective factors by Rivik and Shate, uh, the bottom of this um, slide. Uh, it gives you a more detailed an analysis of the source of differentions. Um, so if you feel a bit angry, uh, you could trace back to the left-hand side to say, okay, could I be externalizing, right? Blaming other people. Um, but sometimes when it's sadness, it could be more like inward focus. Maybe I, I'm personalizing. I'm taking things personally. Does that explain things a bit better too? Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right. So um, in closing, I just want to share this um, uh, metaphor of kintsuchi. Uh, I might have bastardized the, the pronunciation here. This is a Japanese art form where the artist takes broken ceramics and glue them together with some kind of a beautiful metal like gold or just something shiny. And um, not as a way to, to hide the brokenness, but as a way to actually highlight the imperfection of that broken um, artwork. And um, it, it's just, a, I think it's, it's a kind of a very paradoxical, but also poignant way of showing how our life can always be full of imperfection, spokenness, and suffering. And we need to learn to appreciate the meaning that we can get out of it and the beauty of it so in closing i also would like to offer a question to you which is what is that uh, thing that you could do to fill up that brokenness that you might be feeling um, during this crisis right now and i look forward to discussing that with you after this call thank you Thank you, Iris. Um, there's a, a lot of food for thought um, <laughs> going uh, going in there. And um, thank you for your time. And first of all, preparing this for volunteering your time and uh, um, yeah, just being with us today. Mm -hmm.